to join us. Wait for a couple of minutes for some friends to come on. I was speaking to someone the other day and they told me, hey, I watch your, your devotions. I go, really? He goes, yeah, you just don't know I watch them, but I actually watch them like, hmm, there's gotta be a way for me to know who's watching. Good morning, welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. If you're on there, give a little wave. My hand's a lot darker than that wave guy that waves. <laughs> so there you go, there's a wave. Good morning. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. If you're in the neighborhood, you can join us here at 5383 Martin Street. Love to have you here. Today we are, good morning, we are in the book of Luke. We'll be looking at chapter 3 this morning as we continue on with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Good morning, Allie. Good morning. Good to see you guys on there. Anybody else? Wave. Did I already wave at that one? Yeah, I think I did. Yep. Wave, wave. Hi, hi, hi. Pretty cool. One of these days, I'm going to have to invite you to on Facebook so you can actually, we can actually see you. Who would want to do that? I don't know if anybody, <laughs> anybody would even want to do that. So, all right. Let's go ahead and pray and and we'll get started. Uh, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity again, Lord, to open up your word and just to dive into it and hopefully learn some truths, uh, Father, about your son, Jesus Christ, what he has done for us, the hope we have in him, Lord, the power and strength that he gives to us, Lord God, but also some truths about ourselves, Father. It's good to realize how weak we are, how vulnerable we are, Lord because that helps us to depend on Jesus even more than ever before. And we wanna cling and hold on to him. Yes, he is our crutch, and I openly admit that I need a crutch, and that crutch is Jesus Christ, because I cannot do anything without him. And I certainly cannot achieve salvation by my own works, or my acts, or my hope, or my positive thinking, Lord. It all comes by the work, and only the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I put my total faith in what he has done. We pray, Lord, you minister to us now through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Willie. Good to see you on there. We're in, in Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> so we have a genealogy in this chapter. So we'll get through this chapter a little quicker than, than normal. <clears throat> so let's continue on as we look at the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, we saw in the last two chapters that John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus Christ, six months older, <clears throat> prophesied by <clears throat> Malachi, by Isaiah, and others that he would be coming before the Messiah would come to prepare and set straight the crooked path uh, so that uh, the people would be uh, prepared to receive the Messiah as he comes into the picture there in Israel at that time. John the Baptist is one of these guys that is totally, totally committed uh, to that ministry that God called him to. He lives out in the wilderness, wears camel's hair, eats honey and locusts. So he dips the locusts in honey and eats the bugs. So talk about the first uh, reality show of guys eating strange food. John the Baptist did that first before anyone else started eating strange food food or delicacies from other nations. There's, there's reality shows that do that, right? Like survival or some of those shows. So, so he literally eats locusts. Some have suggested that no, they're not locusts. Locust was a plant and the plant uh, is what he ate and not necessarily the, the locust. I don't agree with that. I don't think the Bible teaches that. So, so let's look at his life. <clears throat> in chapter two, it says now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod being uh, tetriarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetriarch of Thurium, and the region of Tetrarchus, and Licinius, tetriarch of Albilene. Now, real quick, it's interesting that Luke, who's the historian, who is a doctor, physician, intelligent man, gives us enough information here that if you were to do some historical research, you could find these events 
in history itself. So I, th I think that's interesting that God, through the Holy Spirit, lays it on his heart to give us places to start if you were to really do a search. There are some people that I have spoken to that have said Jesus never existed. Those events never existed. And so you're believing in a fairy tale. I think that we have enough evidence in the Gospel of Luke itself to see that these were historical events that took place. It was historical people that actually lived at that time who were dealing with Jesus. And we do have historical documents that mention Jesus Christ. Tychicus, Josephus, and others the like that have mentioned Jesus' name, even mentioned Christianity, even mentioned the struggles and the death of Jesus himself and the fact that he resurrected uh, which the religious leaders were very upset at. So if you do your homework and you really are interested in finding out truth or you're just interested in yourself and living in your sin, then you won't do that homework. But if I think that if you do, you'll find these historical figures here did exist uh, during the time of Jesus. Now, Ananias, uh, um, Sapphira being high priest, or Caiaphas being high priest, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the regions around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. What is preaching the baptism of repentance? Repentance means believe, believe what God says is wrong and then turning away from that. So we agree with God and say that sin is wrong. What is sin? Well, when we think of sin, we always think of some, some big act, you know, like murder. I've never committed murder. You know, like uh, uh, stealing the jewels of, you know, such and such. Um, we think of sin that way, or, or lying, or cheating. But sin basically means this in the Greek. It means missing the mark. God has set the mark, the standard, the perfection, and that is our goal is to hit that mark. They take it from the old English word where they would um, have contests in archery. And they would put the, the bullseye way out there and the archer would stretch his bow and he would try to hit the mark, which is bullseye. And he would let the arrow go. And if he hit the mark, it was bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. They'd all scry. But if he missed it, they would literally call out, sinner, sinner, sinner. He missed the mark. He missed the mark. And so... You can give it a, a negative and harsh uh, meaning. It's not saying that. It is saying that you just are not capable of hitting the mark and God's standards. Uh, so repentance from missing the mark is turning away from that and agreeing with God. You can't hit the mark. And so you need to repent. You need to say, I agree with you, God. I, am, I have never loved you with all my heart, soul, and strength. I have not kept the Sabbath holy. I have, I have not loved and honored my father and mother completely. I have stolen, I have cheated, I have lied, I have committed adultery, I have coveted my neighbor's goods, my neighbor's wife, you know, and so forth and so forth. I've broken all those laws. So I repent from those things. And so John is kind of preparing this, this baptism, baptism of repentance and remission from sin to turn from it. And he goes on and says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. every mountain and hill brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now some of these things have come true. This is a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3, 4, and 5. They came true in the sense that the Messiah did come, and that he set things right. But have everything else been done yet? No, not yet. That's still future where God's going to set everything in order and restore uh, what sin has destroyed in this world. <clears throat> so this is twofold in that it will be a future fulfillment, and yet it had been a historical fulfillment in Jesus Christ himself. Um, John is that voice crying in the wilderness. The theology of evangelism or sharing your faith is a very important theology. It's one that every Christian believer should understand and know. That we ought to be light to this world. We should be salt. Light in the sense that our righteousness is a reflection of our Father. And when men see our righteousness and our righteous acts, they'll see our Father in heaven because it points to Him. Salt in that salt does two things. And I think the the, the 
general meaning of salt is, is that it's a uh, preserver. That it is a preserver. And, and Christ has come to preserve us. But salt also is a healer <clears throat> in that it heals. It, it's uh, disinfective in a sense, you know, kills germs when you get a cut and so forth. But it also preserves life. I believe, if I'm correct, and correct me, ladies, you here are horse lovers and animal lovers, but you have to actually buy blocks of salt for horses uh, because they need that salt. And I don't know the reason. I probably because of the water, keep maintain, um, keeping them hydrated so the water stays in them, and they're nodding. Well, how do I know this? I have no idea, but I just do. <laughs> but, um, so salt is also a sustainer of life itself. We ha We are salt to this world. So by... Our relationships that God has given us with unbelievers, we can be life to people at times. Um, sometimes we can be the only hope. And so we need, to, we need to be crying out the gospel to other people. We need to invite them to church. You know, if every person in our church were just to invite one person, we'd double in size. We would double in size that quick. And so we need to look for those opportunities. John was called to this. He had a passion for it. And he was preaching to the crowds to turn from their sins. Look what he says in verse 7. Then he said to the multitude that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's a question. Now, if you're going to start a sermon... I don't know if you want to start that way. <laughs> you know? Can you imagine every Sunday morning as everyone sits down and had a nice, wonderful worship service, and all of a sudden I go, you brood of vipers? Who asked you to come to this church and get right with God? <laughs> you know? Eventually, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> but John was very bold, very accurate, very sincere, in reaching out to the religious leaders. And he was speaking to them. And you know what a brood of vipers is? It's not snakes, but it's the brood. It's the babies of snakes. And they say that the babies of snakes are more dangerous than the adults because they don't know how to release the venom when they bite you. They give you everything they got, and they'll kill you. And he's calling them the most venomous of creation. They're broods of vipers. And who have it wasn't a warning of condemnation. It was a warning of correction. Uh, we oftentimes get very sensitive because we feel like we're attacked. We're attacked. Someone last night said, I felt like that was directed towards me. Like it wasn't directed towards you. Uh, it was directed towards a correction that happens in the body of Christ, that we have distractions and we shouldn't be distracting people. We always get that way. And then, uh, then comes the excuses. But I don't really mean it. And I didn't really, and this and that and this, and all these excuses. You know, you know what? What we need to do and realize is that we have sinned. We've fallen short. And so John is just saying, you're a brood of vipers. That's the fact. You're evil. You're sinful. That's the fact. But, look it, show, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children from Abraham from these stones. And so what he's saying is there's hope. Just t repent, turn to God, and then show forth fruit. And by the way, there is fruit for a true believer. If you're here listening to this message, if you're here in this church, and you're saying, well, I've accepted Jesus Christ into my heart. Okay, that's wonderful. But how are you bearing fruit? That's the next question. Where's the fruit that's evidence that you have been born again? Because there should be fruit. If I plant an orange tree in my orchard of 12 trees, or probably four now because some of them died, but if I plant that tree in there, what do I expect to get out of that orange tree? Oranges. Oranges. If I get apples, something's wrong. <laughs> if I get lemons... Something is really wrong. I should get apples, and I should get apples within a, an amount of time, right? Within at least the season as it comes around. If you, if you plant it in winter, you should probably by summer start to see some, actually by, by spring, start to see some budding, and then some fruits may be possibly coming. Not a whole lot, but you should see some. And then that's evidence, oh, it is an orange tree. This is wonderful, or an apple tree. Did I say apple? Orange. orange. So it is an orange tree, right? And then, of course, you now have the f evidence that it is an orange tree. And then what you do after you have your harvest, what do you do to the tree? You prune it. 
and then it goes through winter and guess when when you prune it because of that pruning next summer what happens you have more and that's what happens is God prunes us and then we're even more fruitful next year so let's look at what some of those those fruits are and you have to I want you to ask yourself where are my fruits as a Christian do I really have fruit and if I don't have fruit then, Lord, I have to repent right now, receive Christ into my heart, and then ask him to help me to have fruit to show evidence that I am saved. The fruit's not going to save you. The fruit is only evidence of what you are already. So I hope that's clear. Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, he said. And you can't blame it on your grandfather, Abraham. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Uh, so that's a warning. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? Good question. He answered and said, He who has two tunics, let him give him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. So here's some evidence. If you have two coats, two tunics, two cars, two of whatever, and someone doesn't have anything and has need of it, give one away. Give it to someone else. That's evidence of your repentance to salvation. Um, if you have food, then give some of that food away to someone else. It should, that should be in your heart. A Christian always has those things in his heart, to be ready to give away what God has blessed you with. We went to a conference this last week, and uh, they gave us uh, lunch, and there were extra uh, boxes of lunches, and so I was gonna take one to eat one, uh, and then Robert, I heard him, I'm going to take some of this for Debbie and them. And so then I had it in my car, and I was thinking I should eat this. But then when I heard that, I thought, no, I should not eat it and just bring it here and give it to them. That should be in our heart. It should be one of the thoughts that we are contemplating. You know, do I really need to eat this right now? There's someone else that probably needs it more than me. So I brought it here and just put it along with uh, Robert's order, too. And then I went home and ate because it was extra. You know, so if you have food, then give it away. That's evidence of your salvation. Jeremy enjoyed it. Very much. Jeremy enjoyed it. <laughs> Look at verse 12. He says, you tax collectors also have come to be baptized. And he said to them, teach, what, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. So in other words, stop stealing. The evidence that you're saved is you stop stealing. You don't think about that anymore. In fact, you're thinking about restoring what you stole. And if you see a dollar on the floor that someone dropped, you pick it up and you go and give it to him. How many of us have gotten the wrong change and gone back to the store and said, hey, you gave me too much? That's what we should do. And that's evidence of our salvation. If you're a, a tax person and you're collecting more than really what you should, collect what is fair. You have wages. You have a family. We understand that. Take what is fair, but don't take any more than that. And he said to them, collect no more than what is, what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldier asked him, saying, what shall we do? So he said to them, do not, imi do not uh, in in intimidate anyone or accuse them falsely and be content with your wages. There's a good one right there. So you have these groups of people listening to John about repentance, right? And they're all going, okay, so what do I have to do, John? The fact that you're asking is evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in you. If you're not asking these questions, if you're not asking how I can help others, how I can better myself, then something's wrong with your relationship with Christ. If all you're asking is why and poor old me and little me and this and that and this happened and that happened, and then you're selfish, self-centered, narcissistic. All you're thinking about is yourself. That's not a born-again believer in Christ Jesus. This soldier says, what do I have to do? And Jesus said, or I'm sorry, John the Baptist said, don't accuse anyone falsely to protect yourself. And don't complain about your wages. That's a big one for a lot of people, even Christians in the work. I deserve more money. I should get paid more. You know, for the amount of work that I do, I should be making this much more money. Be content with what God has given you and use it wisely for his glory so don't complain about your wages. Now, as the people were, ex, uh, were in expectation and all reason in their heart about John, whether he was the Christ or not, so some were looking at John and says, maybe he's the Messiah. No, he couldn't be the Messiah. So they're having the, that question in their mind. John answered, saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, 
But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So he's speaking of the Messiah that will come. The baptism of water is just a symbol of dying to the old man and raising to the new man. When Jesus comes, he will literally cause you to die to the old man through the Spirit of God and his power and raise you through the Spirit of God into the new man and give you that power to live that new life in Christ Jesus. So he's saying to them, I'm not the Messiah, but there's one that's coming. And it's, he says his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. So John is saying when that Messiah comes and he offers the gift of salvation, there will be a point when you reject it and he'll come again and he will judge this world. And he will, like winnowing fan, when you're collecting your harvest and you're separating the wheat from the shaft, he will judge the shaft. The wheat will be his people and his children, which he'll save. The shaft will be that which he burns up. Now, here's the process of doing that. Whenever you were a farmer and you began to, to uh, harvest your crop, you would pile everything up into a pile, shaft and wheat. They would find an area that was a little higher than, than normal, and they would be in an area where the wind is blowing. They would take a shovel or something, and they would, a pan maybe even, scoop it, throw the wheat and shaft up, the wheat would fall down, the shaft would get blown away a little bit because of the wind. And they would just keep doing that. So you'd have two piles, the wheat and then the shaft. And what do you do with the shaft? You take a match to it and you burn it up and it's gone. And the wheat you make into bread and it's fruitful. So John is relating that um, custom of that time in harvesting to what Jesus is gonna do in the end times. And then he goes on and says, Herod the, tri the, the Tetriarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, and for all the evil uh, which Herod has done. Now, Herod, who was the king of the Jews, uh, half Jew, half Samaritan, uh, very brilliant man, great architect, uh, could does, he does some beautiful work with the temple. There, even to this day, there's an aqueduct that goes by the Sea of uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea uh, along Capernaum. It's still there today. I saw it and went into his palace where he built along the ocean, and so forth. Um, but as as is true of even today, people that are in politics and in money sometimes are very corrupt. And he took his brother's wife even though she was still married to his brother. And John warned him that he was gonna be judged because of that. And Herod did not like that very much, so uh, he shut him up in prison in verse 20. Now, verse 21, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized while, while, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which says, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. Then he goes through and he mentions his ancestry all the way to verse 38, uh, the, son of, uh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And so Adam being the son of God, Jesus is like Adam being the son of God, the first true Adam. So you have the genealogy there. I have a couple of minutes. So in verse 21 or 22, we see the Trinity taking place there, the doctrine of the Trinity. People will say, well, there's no word Trinity used in the Bible. We don't see Jesus referencing the Trinity at all. Well, there's a lot of words that aren't used in the Bible. Theology is not used in the Bible, yet there is a, a, a definition of theology that we find throughout scriptures. So just because a word isn't used in the Bible doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, rapture is not used in the Bible. That word rapture is not used. Caught up is, snatched away is, but that's what rapture means, that we're going to be caught up and, and snatched away. Uh, I always liken that to a, a can of nuts and bolts and all kinds of garbage and trash and wood pieces and plastic you know, screws and things like this, and you take a huge magnet, you put it over the can, 
All the metal will be raptured up, the rest will stay behind. So all those that are true believers will be raptured up and the rest will be behind. So this doctrine of the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very simple. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But there's only one God. So they're all God in essence and in being, but they're all three distinct individuals or persons. You have the Father who is in authority, and it is his plan. You have the Son, Jesus Christ, who does everything that the Father directs him to do. He's submitted to the Father in every way. And then you have the Holy Spirit that has anointed and given the power and the authority to do these things. You also have wonderful pictures of various ministries in the world there that we see trinities. For instance, you have the Father in a home who has the authority whose plan should unfold. And then you have the wife, who is to be like the church, submissive to the Father, uh, doing the will of the Father. And then you have the Holy Spirit, his representation is what? Of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit represents Jesus. The children are to represent the Father and the spouse. So you have a form of trinity there. You also have that within the church itself. You have the authority of the pastor, uh, the board, the elders, the other pastors, the leadership there. Then you have the church itself and functioning as, as the son. You know, and then the anointing that goes along with that to get the work done. So Trinity is all over the place. But we see the Trinity in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are some that believe that, that the Father and Jesus are the same. They're both the fathers and they're both the sons. That's not true. They're in distinct individuals. There are some that think that Jesus is an angel, Michael the archangel, that's the Jehovah Witnesses. And the Holy Spirit is just like electricity. It's just power. It's not a being at all. It's the thing that gets things done in, in the sense. And then you have the Father. There are some that, that believe that um, Jesus is just a good teacher. That he's just the Messiah. Uh, but he's not God in, in the sense he's a created being. That's Jehovah Witnesses also, but they also believe he's Michael the Archangel. And then you have the Mormons who believe they're all God, you know, including them, that they're going to become God one day and have their own celestial planet and live for eternity. So, so you have the doctrine of the Trinity there in verses 21 and 22. You have the Father acknowledging the Son. You have the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove, not literally, though it's in some sort of bodily form, but like a dove. It's not necessarily a dove falling upon Jesus and anointing him for the work that he's going to do. So from this point on now, we're going to see the ministry of Jesus Christ. So chapter four, we're going to look at uh, Jesus's temptation by, by Satan. We are not going to see John the Baptist anymore. Uh, he has been taken out of the picture. Uh, Luke doesn't mention him, but the other gospels mention him that he was beheaded by Herod uh, because of the accusations that John brought against him. So he died for his faith. And he, as he prophesied himself, I must choose to continually decrease in this life and I must choose to allow him, that is Jesus Christ, to continually increase in my life. That's how the Greek says it. And so we have to make that choice, guys. God has given us that choice. And some of us here have to make choices. You have to stop. You just have to stop contemplating. You have to stop making excuses. You have to make the choice to start living for Jesus Christ. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, please post them on Facebook or private message me and we will be praying for you here at our church um, this morning. How can I do this? I, I can't do it. Okay. I was going to try to show you everything that's here right now. Oh, there we go. And there's Miss Patty. Say hi, Miss Patty. Good morning, church. All right. So God bless you guys. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your beautiful word for the work of your servant, John the Baptist, for Jesus Christ, as we continue to see uh, his uh, life and ministry as he walked this earth, Father. I pray for your people as, as they go out to work or as they stay home. Help them, strengthen them, empower them, encourage them, Lord God. If any of them, Lord, are, fear, are feeling low and down, I pray they call someone. Find encouragement somewhere, Lord. Uh, don't, don't live in it. Don't dwell in it. Uh, let it go. Let God have it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day.